Hello, this is Sally Wiener Grotta. And Daniel Grotta. And this is the Arts and Letters Show. Uh, today we are here with Patrick Cargan. Um, among Patrick's many accomplishments as a journalist and information technology expert, uh, he is the author of this new book, Data Protection for Photographers. Uh, it is filled with all kinds of information that all of us need. Um, those of us who have large libraries of photographs or digital images, and it's the issue that we all like to pretend can go away, and it's back up and archiving and protecting our images. Um, it's, I have to admit, I'm not that good at this either, and I've been in uh, digital imaging and photography since its very beginning. That may be one of my problems. My library is just so large. Um, Patrick has been an avid photographer since he was 12 years old. Welcome to the crowd, Patrick, on that. And uh, Daniel and I know Patrick from the Internet Press Guild. Uh, so he is a pal as well as an expert that we hope we're going to learn some a few things from. Before we start, uh, Patrick, Daniel, I want to set one ground rule. Let's keep geek jargon to a minimum. It's about pictures and saving and protecting our pictures. And I uh, hope that's okay with both of you. Geek jargon, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick, uh, could you say something again? I, it sounded like you faded out. I said that was fine by me. Great. Um, okay, let's start with the basics. Why are images lost? What do we do wrong that might be preventable? I think that it's not just images that are lost, but we lose data all the time. Uh, and the problem is it's a little different for photographers because of the massive amounts of data we're trying to store. And the, the approaches that small businesses use, for example, don't necessarily work well. Now, a lot of individuals and small businesses are at risk of losing data for lots and lots of reasons. And one of the major reasons is that there's just a lack of sufficient redundancy of backups mm -hmm. to make sure data doesn't go away, if there's redundancy at all. And there's also reliance on mechanisms that either don't necessarily work that well or were never really designed for data protection. What common mistakes or misconceptions uh, gives folks um, a sense of secure backup? but what aren't practical or secure? Well, one, one of them I see a lot is, is people say, well, I've got two external hard disks. I'll back up to one and then take it home, and then the next week I'll back up to the other. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that, first of all, any corruption that occurs is probably going to end up on both of those disks at one point or another. That's one of the problems. So you really... That would be similar to the issue of RAID, of having two uh, hard drives in the computer, too, yes. wouldn't it? RAID, RAID is definitely not backup. RAID was designed for system reliability. Uh, the, the fact that you sometimes can save data is, is almost, uh, it, well, it's kind of secondary. But RAID is, and people think that if they also back up to a RAID array, then they're protected because it has redundancy separately from their internal hard disk, well, it has the same problems. RAID arrays do fail, and it's designed for downtime protection more than data protection. Uh, just to uh, help with definition, uh, RAID is when there are two hard drives in a computer, or in the case of my Pentax 645D camera, two memory cards within a camera, and it, they are simply saving to both drives just in case. Yeah, that, that, that version of RAID is also called mirroring. There are other versions of RAID that will that will spread data across multiple disks, three, four, five, or more. And now, um, in the uh, PDF that we receive, uh, which you describe ten common myths of backup, uh, you seem to indicate that uh, tape was more reliable than DVDs or hard drives. Um, our personal experience is just the opposite. We used to back up the DAT tape 
and uh, it turned out all of those dad tapes are completely unreadable. Um, so why this apparent uh, conflict or contradiction? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, actually, DAP tape is is one of the more reliable versions of tape. Many of the older versions were not all that reliable. DAT itself wasn't bad if stored properly and handled properly, but there were software problems with tape have been one of the biggest issues over the years, either in terms of the data never really got to tape, uh, or it was written to tape in a format that you couldn't read later because you didn't have the software, or many other reasons. In terms of actual uh, reliability of the media, uh, modern tape such as LTO Ultrium tape is a good hundred times as reliable as hard disk in terms of uh, bit error rates. Now, all of this depends on how it's stored. Also, LTO tape is, and through experiences pretty much borne out, is rated at, they say, 30 years. You'll never get to that point because you're going to change media in eight to ten, seven to ten years anyway. But the point is, in terms of storage, it, it is rated highly. It has proven its worth that way. It's used by virtually all major video production organizations. Um, so our problem was that we were using first generation DAT tapes. Yeah, the problem was probably that. It was the software. It was the, the alignment of the drives was a problem on DAT. And uh, you said it has to be stored properly. What is the proper way to store tape? Uh, just ma maintain normal humidity and temperature. I mean, it's not... It's not it's reasonably resilient to changes in temperature and humidity, but you know, like anything else that has magnetic or electronic components, you want to protect it from the elements. Are we living in a fool's paradise? We have about 15 external drives that range from 500 gigs up to 2 terabytes. <laughs> and we plug them in periodically, back up to them. We have them stored at our Philadelphia apartment uh, as well as here in the studio. Um, what are we really facing? Uh, are we looking at a loss of data or do we at least have some redundancy and hope that we can recover if uh, we lose our hard drive? Well, it sounds like you have some redundancy, but let, let me ask you a somewhat rhetorical question. How long does a hard disk last? Mm, I've uh, experienced 10, 15 years with some drives. With, 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 we lost you. Uh, 10 or 15 years. In fact, I have an external uh, carrier that I can just plug in uh, a SATA drives, uh, uh, just like their uh, uh, swappable hard drives. Right. And so it, it reads them. Your experience has been that you've had drives last as long as 10 or 15 years, and I've had the same experience. I've had other drives fail in a year and a half. Whoops. So the, the, the point being that it's, it's relatively unpredictable. Vendors will tend to say about five years. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you've, uh, I bought a one terabyte drive uh, about two years ago with a three-year warranty. The three terabyte drive I just bought has a two-year warranty. So as yeah, as I've noticed that it's gotten shorter and shorter. <laughs> now here's the other issue: uh, vendors will say about five years, and as as you know, that can that doesn't re reflect reality because we've both had drives last much longer and. Less. Well, if I can uh, sort of throw in one of these geek speaks, there's something called MTBF. It means mean time between failure. And drive manufacturers used to say exactly how many hours uh, a drive would last before failure. They don't publish MTBFs anymore. Right, and even when they did, that was that was pretty much an educated guess. <laughs> It wasn't, it wasn't a promise. Now, uh, if I could interrupt these uh, two gentlemen who love talking hardware and software, um, I'd like to get down to some practicality, Patrick. Uh, when you come home from a vacation or a photo shoot, well, maybe I should not uh, go there because it may be a case of do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> so maybe I should rephrase it. 
What do you recommend as the first steps for protecting image files? I've come back from a major photo shoot, and there I am with all these memory cards. What do you, what do you recommend I do? Well, the first thing I do is I transfer those cards to my computer, mm -hmm. and I back them up to at least one additional source, one additional target, before I do anything. And that's before I ever, ever erase or format or do anything to the cards. In fact, I know I don't, I don't erase files from a card in the field. And oh, never. About some of the possible issues with that. Uh, you're probably going to get away with it, but there are times where you might not. So, I bring it home, load it in. I use Lightroom, so I pull it in into Lightroom. I also move everything to an external hard disk, and then that. Um, I also do a secondary backup that goes off-site from that. So I back up to an external disk, and then that gets backed up off-site. In addition, <laughs> I, I kind of go overboard because I do uh, I use uh, Crash Plan to back up some stuff online and some stuff to a server I have. So I I have of my photos I have at least three backups with versioning. Well, I. Uh Lightroom itself allows you to uh, uh, upload pictures from a memory card and put it to a secondary uh, um, drive or a device right there in the interface. Do you use that facility or do you do it on your own? I, I do it on my own because I, I, that's hard to incorporate that into my backup routine. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it's not a good way to do it. But for me, I have a backup routine that backs, more, backs up more than Lightroom. I also back up periodically to tape. Well, we said we wouldn't do geek speak, but uh, let me try to clarify something. Uh, what is the difference between backing up and archiving, and why would you do one or the other or both? Backup really means uh, saving data, copying data for recovery purposes, emergency recovery purposes. Archiving means long-term storage. Um, they, they Quite frankly, they can be the same and they can be different depending on how you're doing things. Large organizations archive things for legal purposes, for example, and they will specifically remove stuff from the archive that they don't want there for legal purposes. So they are, they are similar, they are related, they are uh, two of the legs of data protection, uh, the other one being emergency recovery, disaster recovery. And uh, backup is part of that, but not all of it. Do you need special equipment or software, uh, or can we just use Microsoft or Apple's uh, system utilities or Adobe's utilities? I personally think you need third-party software. Um, Microsoft's utilities have gotten worse and worse with each version of Windows to the point where uh, the 8.1 utilities are almost unusable for our purposes. Um, Apple's Time Machine is pretty good in what it does, but it has limitations. Uh, there are some great uh, software utilities that I talk about in the book that um, I've had good experience with for both Apple and for Windows and also some for Linux as well. Uh, but I think you, you need third-party utilities. What do you think about backing up to the cloud? I think it is a good thing to do as part of your backup procedure, not your only backup procedure. But, but that you, doesn't, doesn't it require an incredible bandwidth? Uh, most people who are dealing with pictures are dealing with, well, more than gigabytes, terabytes of data. Isn't it expensive also? It is expensive and it requires bandwidth. Now, in terms of the expense, that's going down. And you have to justify that expense, but the, the cost is going down. And some of the some of the services do provide. They claim unlimited storage, but in general they'll throttle you down or do something. But even even if 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 you if you look at the value of your data, uh, even terabytes online might be worthwhile. And you can with most of the vendors you can seed your online uh, backup by sending them one or more hard disks, for example. 
big problem is trying to recover all that stuff is going mm -hmm. to be time consuming. So that's yeah, why but are, how can you be assured that company's going to be in business five years from now? Yeah, that's, there's, there's a whole there are a whole bunch of issues around online backup that, that I talk about in the book. The other approach is private cloud, and that's the approach I'm taking where um, I have a device at another location that I back up to. Uh, so it, it's off-site, but it's under my control. It sounds uh, something complicated to set up. Would the average artist be able to uh, put a computer in somebody else's home and back up to it through the cloud that way? And um, can the average artist afford a redundant backup system, as you suggest? Well, that, let me ask you that last question first. What's, what's the most valuable asset you have? Mm -hmm. Data. Yep. So, uh, when it comes to spending money on a new camera body or protecting your data, uh, I know which I want to do. Which <laughs> <laughs> is the most important. And how difficult is it to set up a private cloud? It requires some expertise. Um, they, the, the vendors make it simple. I mean, the, the, the vendors of what are called NAS devices, network attached storage, uh, including uh, iOmega, and uh, they're called, uh, they have a new name, Lenovo EMC, no, Lenovo EMC, uh, Seagate, uh, Netgear, all have private cloud functions attached to their, their NAS devices. And it's relatively easy, but you may want to get some help from somebody who's knowledgeable. If I can just distillate this down to some specifics, uh, what do you recommend as a practical backup solution for an average photographer that would combine uh, redundancy, protection, and affordability? Um, can you give us some names and price ranges? It, it, it's, it's a bit difficult to do because it's if you're using a Mac, versus the PC, it's a very different set of solutions. Um, I do talk about that in the book. I, I give some recommendations of products that I've looked at that uh, fit the bill. It's, it's not a definitive list, and so much of it depends on the way an individual works as well. So I can't be that specific, but I can say that uh, in my case, I use at least three separate backup products. Uh, well, we get to the other ver great expense in all of this, and that's time. We're all crunched for time. Uh, do you have any shortcut suggestions to set up a good system and workflow that uh, an artist isn't spending uh, way too much time every week securing their data? Yeah, all of, all of my backup is, is automated. Uh, I, I will give you a couple recommendations. I use one product I use is Altero Oops Backup. Very good. <laughs> it gives you redundancy, lets you back up to two, uh, two targets at the same time. Uh, I also use um, Crash Plan for online backup, and I use Retrospect for tape. So, And Retrospect is widely used in the Mac world as well. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for giving us all this information and suggestions. Uh, I appreciate it, and we're going to try to take some of it to heart. So this is Daniel Grata. And this is Sally Wiener Grata. And before we sign off, I did want to give you uh, Patrick's website, which is DP Workflow. Is that right? Yes. DP dpworkflow.com, and you can reach him there. His book is Data Protection for Photographers, but it's really a wealth of information for anybody who has large image files or even just large data files. And this is the Arts and Letters Show. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.